In the 32 years that I've been privileged to serve as an ordained minister in the Episcopal Church, more than half my 60-year-old life, I've had the opportunity to travel to a number of different countries outside the United States. I visited the United Kingdom, Japan, Israel, Palestine, Egypt, Jordan, Turkey, Ghana, Malta, Ecuador, Canada, and Mexico, and nowhere have I felt like more of a foreigner than I do in Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> Having spent 56 of my 60 years on the east coast of this country, in the summer of 2010, I drove without a passport from Annapolis to Lexington to Tulsa to Albuquerque to Los Angeles. California law requires that within 10 days of moving into the state, you exchange your driver's license for a California one. On day 10 of my residency, I dutifully went to the nearest branch of the Department of Motor Vehicles and found that the California Driver's Handbook was published in 10 different languages. Spanish, Armenian, Chinese, Farsi, Korean, Punjabi, Russian, Tagalog, Vietnamese, and English. <laughs> After waiting in line an hour and a half to get an English copy of the driver's handbook, <laughs> I waited in another line for another hour in order to take the written driver's test, which I failed in 15 quick minutes. <laughs> All this for the privilege of spending hours more sitting in Los Angeles traffic. <laughs> Within 20 days of moving to Southern California, or SoCal as we call it, I found myself reliving adolescence for the fourth time in my life. <laughs> I found that I worked less than a mile from McArthur Park. I was driving on Ventura Highway. I was California dreaming, and I actually met a little old lady from Pasadena. <laughs> there were other things that I learned. The Inland Empire is not something out of Star Wars. <laughs> it's a real geographic region. In Southern California, we don't have weather. We have climate. When we have weather, it's a front page news story. The freeways all have names as well as numbers. And if you use the number to identify a particular freeway, you put a definite article in front of it. The 210. The 5. The coral <laughs> traffic jam, the possibility of an earthquake, windstorm, or fire, and sightings of wildlife on city streets are daily occurrences. And when a 10-mile stretch of the 405 is closed for a 48-hour period in order to safely blow up an old bridge, the resulting traffic detours are called Carnegie. <laughs> I could go on, but you get the picture. So the question, how should we sing the Lord's song in a strange land, is one that I feel I can readily own. It is a question it would be helpful to ask in our church, since the church is finding itself increasingly in the strange land of the larger culture. In preparation for this meditation, I ask myself a derivative question. If I were suddenly plucked up out of my familiar surroundings and sat down in a group of strangers who had never before heard of the Christian faith, and I were asked to explain or teach or in some way share that faith, what biblical story would I use? Of all the multitude of stories in Holy Scripture, what one story would most help me identify and offer the core values of our faith? What one story would I use? Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing and he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, 
looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all of Scripture. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. It is the evening of the third day following Jesus' crucifixion, the first day of the week. Two disciples are making the seven-mile trek from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they are doing what I think everyone does in the aftermath of a cataclysmic event, trying to make sense out of it, trying to understand it. They are retreating, in a way, from a complex urban Jerusalem which has now become sinister to them in its crucifixion of Jesus to a simpler rural Emmaus, which seems comforting, at least, in its remembered simplicity and familiarity. And the disciples are talking with each other. They are talking about all these things that had happened. They are reflecting together on past events, and perhaps their own previous actions, actions that have turned out disastrously. In fact, they might even be more than a little scared concerning their own safety. If the Committee on Unroman Activities has nailed their leader to the cross, they better watch out as well. So they are heading out of Jerusalem to the relative safety of suburban Emmaus, a stranger appears and walks along with them while they struggle to understand the immediate past events. We, the readers, are permitted to know that the stranger who joins them on the road is Jesus, risen from the dead. But the disciples do not recognize him. That's the part of the story that excited me as a child. I felt like I was being let in on a secret. I knew it was Jesus, risen from the dead, but these disciples don't recognize him. And so the question formed in my mind, what will it take for those disciples to recognize the risen Jesus? The risen Jesus asks them what they are discussing. 
And you know what the disciples' response is? It's really a form of the gospel in miniature. They respond, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word, before God and all people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. The disciples even include the witness of the women disciples who went and found an empty tomb, proclaimed that the fact that Jesus is alive to the other disciples, and had their report corroborated by yet other disciples. What's missing? The only thing missing here is that these two disciples themselves do not believe in the resurrection. They can recite who Jesus was, they can tell the story of what happened to him. They can even share the witness of the women who discovered the empty tomb and were encountered by a vision of angels. But these two disciples do not yet believe. And the risen Jesus is even journeying along the road with them. What's it going to take for these two disciples to recognize him? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all scriptures. What the risen Jesus says to them, in effect, is if you want to know what is going on now, you have to know what went on before. If you want to understand the present, you must understand the past. If you want to know what it means to be a Jew today, you'll have to reflect on what it meant to be a Jew in Moses' time, in Isaiah's time, in Jeremiah's time. The risen Jesus interprets for them the scriptures concerning this situation, and that helps at least intellectually, the two disciples get a little background material to inform the situation, the information they're struggling with. Bible study is important. <laughs> Knowing our roots is important. Knowing our heritage, our traditions is important. But it's not enough. The risen Jesus himself interprets scripture for these two disciples and they still don't recognize him. What will it take for them to recognize him? <coughs> we come to an interesting point in the story. The risen Jesus has come to them, engaged in conversation and instruction with them, and now appears to be leaving, unrecognized. <laughs> now, however, the disciples move from reflection <coughs> to action. They don't just invite him, they constrain him. They urged him strongly to stay with them. They opened the way for the stranger to become guest. Stay with us, for evening is at hand, and the day is past. It is the turning point. For instead of continuing to talk about redemption, they act it out. They engage in a redeeming deed, inviting a total stranger to share a meal. Their action changes the stranger from a stranger to a companion. Because you know what the word companion really means? It's from the Latin cum panis, with bread. Our companions in this world are the ones with whom we share bread. For these two disciples, the shift, the turning point, is from truth talked about to truth lived out from reflection to action. They sit down to a simple meal, and contrary to custom, the guest becomes the host, takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them. Action is responded to with action. What they now receive through the risen Jesus' action is not more information or more Bible study or more question, but a new relationship. The stranger has become guest, and the guest has become host. Recognition and awareness now come to the disciples. And this new awareness is not only about the present moment, but about the past as well. They see not only what is happening around the table, but what was happening along the road, even though at the time they could not take it in. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was opening the scriptures to us? 
What happens when we celebrate the Eucharist together is that the present enacting of the truth gives life and power to the previous discussion of the truth. The action of the sacrament deepens the reflection on the past. And that's not even the end of the story. No sooner do they recognize the risen Christ, no sooner does everything come together for them in a flash of wonderful recognition and awareness than Jesus vanishes. We may have some problems with the biology of that statement, but let's not let that blind us to the theology of it. What the evangelist Luke is telling us here is that once the moment of insight has been received around the table, the action is no longer around the table. The action is somewhere else. That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They left the safety and familiarity and nourishment and comfort of their table fellowship in Emmaus and returned to the riskiness and complexity and even barrenness and challenge of Jerusalem. The disciples couldn't stay in Emmaus, lifting their glasses and saying to each other, Wow, have we ever had a profound religious experience? Awesome, dude! Awesome! No, the experience required that they risk themselves in sharing it with others, that they go back to Jerusalem not just to tell the truth, but to do the truth. Not just to share their experience of the risen Jesus, but to continue his mission and ministry in the world with those about whom the world cares least, the poor and the oppressed, the sick, the friendless, the needy, and those in prison. We gather together in churches every week to celebrate the risen Christ's presence among us in the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. We sing songs and pray prayers and listen to scripture lessons that have to do with our roots. Sometimes we discuss with each other recent tumultuous events. Sometimes we simply gather around the table to be nourished by the bread broken for us, by the wine spilled out for us offered by a stranger who we've invited to be guest, who has quite suddenly become host. And what we are to recognize here in the Eucharist, in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the wine at table, is Christ's presence as the stranger become companion. And what we are to see as well is that the action doesn't stop at the table. That, for us, is a maze. We are called to go back to Jerusalem, to go out into the world in joyful witness to Christ's love, to feed the hungry, heal the sick, clothe the naked, free the oppressed, shelter the homeless, confront evil, sin, and injustice, and manifest to the glory of God the power of the love that has overcome death. So what can we learn from this? I think I've learned three basic things about singing the Lord's song during the time I've been privileged to serve in the foreign land we call SoCal, <laughs> Southern California. And I'm going to be bold enough to share with you. These three things are not exhaustive, but I believe they are important. They are informed both by experience and the story of the road to Emmaus. The first has to do with the importance of being yourself. For three years, I had to work at being myself, because even though I thought I knew who I was, in the familiar context of the East Coast. When all the reference points change, when the context was entirely different, when people and places and languages spoken and customs observed were new and even foreign to me, in order to be myself, I had to learn who I was all over again. What are my core values? What has God called me here to offer? How am I to serve? The cataclysmic event of Jesus' crucifixion shattered the hopes of his disciples, and two of them retreated to the relative safety and familiarity of the man. Who were they now that their leader had been executed? What were they to do? How was Israel to be redeemed? 
Are not these questions similar to the ones we're asking about the Episcopal Church? Who are we as church? What are our core values? How is it that God wants us to serve the world when the world is so very different than it was even 20 years ago? How do we sing the Lord's song in the foreign land of where we live? The second thing I've learned has to do with hospitality. Hopefully, we know how to practice basic hospitality. I want to emphasize that aspect of hospitality, which has to do with creating and allowing space for the other. And I mean for the other to be fully who she or he is. Do I allow enough space, physically and psychologically, for the stranger to feel safe, to experience the opportunity of sharing, communing, exchanging? I wonder what would have happened in the May if, when the stranger took the bread and began to bless it, Cleopas or the other disciples stopped him and said, now wait a minute, stranger, this is my house. I'll do the blessings here. <laughs> What about the church? Do we practice the kind of hospitality that allows enough space for the stranger to become guest, and maybe even the guest to become host? It may be a challenge to our own ways of doing things, but it is also that luminous place where the mystical inhabits. The third thing I've learned is the importance of practicing cultural humility. I use this phrase particularly in place of the phrase cultural competence. Cultural competence may say to another, I not only have a handle on my culture, but I'm also completely fluent in your culture, so let's talk. <laughs> cultural humility says, I would like to learn about your culture. Will you share it with me? along with the willingness to share one's own culture. Cultural humility incorporates a lifelong commitment to self-evaluation and self-critique, to redressing the power imbalances in the relational dynamic, and to developing mutually beneficial and non-paternalistic partnerships with people. With people, communities, other biases, and churches that are different from one's own. Cultural humility begins in relationship and manifests itself in mutuality and reciprocity. Practicing cultural humility is essential if we are serious about reconciling the world to God through Christ. So, sisters and brothers, here we are again at the renewal of ordination vows, praying and worshiping and breaking bread together, discussing and reflecting upon all the things that have happened in our lives and in the world. As a church and as individuals, we might ask, how do we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And there are many different ways to do that. I suggest that if you find that the strange land is where you live, you might consider rediscovering yourself so that you can be all of who you are. Offer hospitality and create space for the other. Practice cultural humility. And above all, remember that it's the Lord's song, so don't forget to sing it.